Hello, this is Dr. Tom Kessler. This is uh, the first in a series of lectures about regression analysis, so welcome. Uh, the lecture series will progress from this lecture, which is about basic concepts, uh, to another lecture on linear, simple linear regression, to a, a third lecture on um, multiple linear regression. The uh, material is organized uh, in a way to make it as easy as possible to understand regression analysis. What you'll understand or appreciate as we go along is that uh, some sections of the content have been organized as concepts. And when you uh, are reviewing the content concept portion of the lectures, uh, your objective is to follow to focus, to understand, but, but, but not to get too tangled up in the concepts. Uh, it's important not to get overwhelmed when we're talking about the conceptual stuff, but try to, to understand at a high level uh, the basic concepts that constitute regression analysis. Uh, there will be a, another set of uh, material that uh, is more mechanical in nature. And when we get to that section of the lecture, which uh, I will point out, uh, there will be things that you will have to do as a student of statistics and regression. Uh, so you're encouraged to take notes. Uh, I'll make the slides available somehow so you can print the slides. Um, and, and you'll have to practice those mechanical concepts because they provide the essential steps in developing a regression model. Um, and then finally, uh, another important part of the lecture material is being able to interpret what regression tells us, uh, to translate it into uh, practical terms, and to be able to communicate the results to others. Because uh, in most cases, we're not simply doing regression analysis for our own benefit. There are lots of different ways to use regression analysis. Uh, you might be a student. Uh, conducting research or a practitioner. Uh, you might be uh, planning to or already enrolled in a capstone uh, or thesis class if you're a graduate student. Um, you uh, might uh, come at this from a different angle. Uh, some classes that use regression analysis focus on, on teaching students decision-making techniques. And regression analysis is very important uh, from a decision-making perspective. Um, if uh, in your profession uh, you're able to uh, demonstrate to uh, those to whom you report, your customers, uh, that you are uh, confident and capable at conducting regression analysis, knowing when to use the tool and how to use the tool and how to communicate the results, uh, it can certainly enhance your career. So decision-making uh, situations is another example of where we use regression analysis. And a third example uh, uh, prompted by another class that is often taught is a class on program evaluation. Uh, being able to look at a particular functional program and ask ourselves, is this program achieving what it was put in place to do? And so again, we can see a very uh, practical application of regression analysis techniques in those situations. Now, the one thing I wanted to say at this point was, it, is that uh, it, for some of you, and this is not true for everyone, uh, you may have encountered uh, uh, past uh, classes, either high school or undergraduate or even graduate, um, where there was an attempt to teach you statistics, but you just weren't sort of uh, getting it, or, or you really struggled just to get through with the passing grade in the statistic class. You might even be a statistics hater, with uh, quote, quotes around it. And, uh, and I think that's unfortunate, because I think uh, if uh, taught correctly, regression analysis is a very powerful tool, and it really helps us as employees, uh, you know, even in our home life, um, have uh, strong analytical capabilities. And so I really want to uh, make sure that as we go through this, that uh, I have no haters left. Uh, by the time we get done. As a matter of fact, you know, I'd like to even encourage as many of you as possible uh, to consider that if you have a teenager, that you would sit with teenagers and teach them to use these powerful tools at a very early age 
so they don't develop a subsequent phobia about the material and the concept. So what is regression analysis? Uh, well, regression analysis is, um, is the study of relationships among variables. Now, variable is a technical term, uh, um, but it's, it's not a complex term. It, it is the phrase we use uh, when we discuss a particular data item or we're studying a particular data item. And so you can see the examples here. Salary might be a variable. Price might be a variable. Grades might be a variable. And distance traveled might be a variable. And I often tell uh, parents that uh, wouldn't it be useful for students, uh, sorry, for their teenagers uh, to understand or determine if there is a relationship between the grades they get in school and their allowances. Wouldn't that be a great study for a particular uh, young person to do with the variables being uh, the allowance uh, being the dependent variable and the grade being the independent variable. Um, so uh, there's lots of, uh, of uh, practical uses here. Regression analysis really has two important uses. One is to understand uh, how things interact, how the world operates, how uh, one thing uh, influences or affects another. It also is useful uh, for making predictions or forecasts about the future. And we'll have an example coming up shortly uh, where we actually try to uh, set up a problem to make predictions about the future. And so we'll try to see this in a practical way. Uh, now, uh, the, the, we introduced the word variables a second ago, but we really need to get a little bit more refined in, in discussing variables, and we need to understand uh, that in regression and in much of statistics, there's two kinds of variables. One is called the dependent variable, and the other is called independent variables. And so uh, when we start an analysis, there is usually one thing that we're trying to study, like uh, um, you know, cancer, uh, you know, how many people have cancer, or we're trying to study uh, um, our income, or we're trying to study um, the uh, distance traveled. So there usually is a main thing for our study. And usually the main thing is the variable that we're going to label our dependent variable because we want to study this dependent variable. We want to say to ourselves, what things in the world impact the dependent variable? And, and then all those other things that we can start to conceptualize or come up with uh, relationship-wise are considered independent variables. So for regression analysis, just understand that we're going to have one dependent variable. And then in the beginning, when we do simple regression analysis, we're going to have one corresponding independent variable. Uh, later, when we study multiple regression analysis, we'll still have one dependent variable, but we'll bring into play uh, multiple possible influencing variables or independent variables. Uh, so we're going to uh, use regression analysis uh, to understand um, how one or more independent variables impact the dependent variable. Uh, and we're going to make sure that our emphasis is on uh, how independent variables influence the dependent variable. And what you'll notice is the dependent variable will be the follower variable, that when we change any of our independent variables, we're curious about what then happens to the dependent variable. So that's really a, a key concept in terms of this terminology. So more terminology, uh, I already mentioned simple or uh, multiple linear regression. Simple linear regression simply means that we're going to have our dependent variable but we're only going to look at one single influencing variable, independent variable. So uh, when we do simple linear regression, we're going to have two variables, a dependent variable and an independent variable. Then when we get to our subsequent lecture, our third lecture on multiple linear regression, we're going to say, uh, well, what if I have one dependent variable and I have three or four or two independent variables influencing that dependent variable at the same time? Uh, and what does that look like? What does that relationship uh, look like? And which of those independent variables have more or less influence on the dependent variable? So we'll get to that later. Uh, the other concept uh, is, uh, and I've mentioned multiple times, we're going to be studying linear regression. And uh, linear regression is when we uh, have uh, a linear relationship, a straight line relationship, uh, between the, the different variables that we have. Uh, now, we'll notice that, uh, you know, we, we will have uh, sometimes relationships uh, that don't seem perfectly linear, but we can still use a straight line through these relationships that may not seem, you know, as linear as we would like, uh, and we can still use linear uh, regression for that. 
Then there's nonlinear regression, which is really uh, about curved relationships. And we find a lot of this in the science area and physics and, and other aspects of science. And uh, just recognize that uh, for nonlinear regression, uh, there's other statistical methods. And those are really uh, more than what we're going to cover in this series of lectures. So we're going to start by focusing on simple linear regression, uh, where we have one dependent variable and one independent variable. OK, now we're going to uh, move into uh, part one. After we finish the introduction, we're going to study uh, variables, scatter plots, and the algebra of lines. So there's a few basic things to, um, to, to, to have grasped or to be ready to discuss. One is that, uh, as I mentioned, we always start by identifying a dependent variable that we want to analyze, our main thing, and the independent variable that we want to see how it influences our dependent variable. Uh, we also uh, need to recognize that one of the objectives of what we're trying to do in regression is to develop a model that, that really best characterizes it, that has really little uh, mistakes or error in it, and best characterizes the relationship between the dependent and the independent variable. So uh, when we uh, develop a straight line through our, our dots that we're going to have uh, representing our dependent independent variable, um, we're going to be uh, drawing a line through those, uh, those dots, those points. And then we're going to have to use some techniques, which we'll get into, to ask ourselves, you know, how good is this line? How, how much does this line really represent the data that we're studying? And so we'll, we'll talk about that. And that's referred to as goodness of fit. So just um, prepare yourself for uh, some extensive discussion of this topic of goodness of fit. Um, there also uh, is some pre-work involved in doing regression. And we'll get into this later mechanically. So uh, conceptually, uh, you just need to appreciate that uh, when you've got a couple of pieces of data, uh, there's a little bit of pre-work to look and see if uh, these two pieces of data, when you plot the data points, actually have some sort of, sort of linear relationship. They may have a curved relationship, in which case you can't use linear regression. Uh, or they may just be this big scatter diagram, in which case there's no predictive value. There's no use in studying the relationship between these uh, data points because they're all over the place. And so we have to do that pre-work, and we'll get into that later. Um, before we get into uh, the mechanical details, though, uh, again, we need to dive a little bit further down into how and why regression analysis works. OK, so uh, one of the uh, most appealing aspects of statistics for people who are visual learners, and I know that uh, many of you probably are, are or would consider yourself more of a visual learner than a person who can read the words and really get it, right? especially when it comes to something like statistics. Um, but the best part of statistics is that we spend a lot of time using visual tools. Uh, we use graphs, charts, and pictures to be able to de depict things. And that, and, and that is, it should be exciting to you if you consider yourself more of a visual learner, because you should be able to study a picture and then be able to extract information from the picture and not just see it as uh, just a bunch of, of data. And so we're going to uh, use uh, scatter plot charts, uh, which are, are going to be our, our version of, of pictures or illustrations, to really uh, map and diagram and, and discuss and analyze uh, the data that we're studying. So recognize that uh, once you um, identify your dependent and independent variable um, and uh, you've collected some data uh, representing the dependent variable and the independent variable, and we'll use an example in a second, that it's time to examine the relationship. And the way we're going to examine relationships between pieces of data, as I said, is we're going to develop a, a chart. And we're going to use a scatter plot tool uh, and we're going to always plot, uh, when we do plots, the dependent variable on the y-axis. That gives us sort of a common way to look at the chart and know that that's my main thing. On the left, left side, and going up and down in the vertical direction, uh, that's the dependent variable. So we're always going to uh, consistently plot the dependent variable on the y-axis. And we're going to plot, uh, for simple linear regression, the independent variable on the x-axis. Um, so uh, what do we need to know to proceed? Well, uh, it's important that we understand how to create a scatter plot. And then the second thing we need to understand, which we'll talk about, is uh, how to really sort of interpret the scatter plot. You know, what do we see? When, especially when we take a scatter plot and we add a line, a, linear, a single straight line, 
through the scatter plot, you know, what can we understand about the different uh, characteristics or dimensions of that line? So first, uh, developing scatter plots uh, beyond the scope of this uh, brief lecture uh, to get into the details about uh, doing scatter plots. Uh, you can certainly use just basic Microsoft Excel to create a scatter plot. And in the example you see on the screen, uh, if you uh, had data as represented in the upper right-hand corner, uh, in the first column, uh, you know, I assume someone's been to a restaurant and they paid their bill. That first column A represents the amount they paid in their bill. And column B represents the amount they left as a tip. Now, uh, I'll tell you that in the example that we'll be working with um, through these lectures, uh, tip amount is our dependent variable. We, we basically want to be able to predict our tip amount. So our question is always going to be, uh, when the bill amount changes, what impact does that have on the tip amount? And so that's uh, going to be our relationship. So I put my independent variable bill amount in column A, uh, at the upper right-hand corner. You can see the values there. And then I put some data about my tip amount in column B. Uh, in Microsoft, I went into Microsoft Excel. Uh, I typed this data in, as you see it. Uh, I used, uh, I select the Insert tab in Excel. And then I selected the Scatter option. And I was given four or five different views. I, I like to pick the one that has the dots, which you see in the bottom left corner here. So I selected that view, and this is the result that I got. Now, you'll notice when you look at the bottom left the diagram that you don't have a lot of information. Basically, you have on the left side some numbers that represent column B, uh, the dependent variable. Along the bottom, you have some numbers that represent column A, which is the bill amount. And then you have your data points representing uh, each of the uh, rows in that table that you see in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, so that's about all you get. You get your data points, uh, you get your uh, Y scale and your X scale, and, and you get a label at the top called TIP, which is not a very good label. Um, and that's what you get from Microsoft Excel. Now, uh, one thing, and we'll talk about this, about this a bit later, is everyone is really encouraged to use something a little more powerful than Microsoft Excel to do statistics and regression analysis in particular. Uh, and I'll talk about the different packages later. But I use a package called Stat Tools uh, from Palisades because it, it comes with, uh, uh, as part of uh, a number of textbooks that uh, we use in teaching statistics. And, and so for many students, they have access to Stat Tools uh, Student Edition because it's free. So I've used Stat Tools uh, also to create the chart on the right-hand side. And I'll show you this in a, a little bigger picture in a second. Uh, and so uh, in Stat Tools, the uh, first thing you do is you uh, create your data set. So you go, and, and I would have blocked out um, in the upper right-hand corner cells A1 down through B7, and defined that as my data set to Stat Tools. Uh, and then I would have selected summary graphs. Uh, I would have uh, set um, the x-axis as bill amount which is the independent variable, and the y-axis, the vertical axis, that's the tip amount, column B. That's all I had to do. It's pretty easy, just little check boxes. And you hit the Enter, and you get this chart on the bottom. Now, let's uh, look at this chart in a little more detail. Um, if you can see it on this here sl this slide, um, it uh, is a little um, better labeled. It has a tip amount on the left-hand side, data set 1. It has the bill amount on the bottom. It still has my data points. Uh, and it has a little title, scatter plot of tip amount versus bill amount of data set one. And then notice down at the very bottom, you can see it's kind of faint, but it says correlation 0.866. Very useful information. Didn't get that with Microsoft Excel, but I did get that with stat tools. And if I use one of the other statistical packages, I'll get other data when I do scatter plots as well. Now, I had to go back in because uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, I can visually look at this, right? And you visual thinkers, right? You ask yourself when you look at these data points, do they sort of represent a straight line? Well, they do. It's not a perfect straight line. There might be some error here, but it's generally a straight line. Well, I went back into my uh, scatter plot uh, options, and I actually uh, selected an option so uh, that uh, stat tools would put a straight line through it, through the data points. And this is the, the result that I got back. So if you sort of look at this, you can see that, in fact, the dots, uh, the data points, are grouped around a straight line in, in some, some degree. And so that's useful information. So for visual thinkers, recognize we're going to use scatter plots um, to be able to visually look at 
the data that we're inputting, um, and that we're going to uh, be asking ourselves questions mechanically as we go through this. You know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was if uh, you can't get a reasonable straight line through your data, there's no sense in using regression analysis. You just can't use a predictive tool if there's no relationship between the two variables. And so uh, we'll talk about, well, what happens when that occurs? What do you do? And I'll get to that later in the mechanical discussion of regression. So uh, now we need to shift our attention. And uh, I worry uh, that uh, some of you uh, might look at this slide and say, oh, no, here it comes. Uh, and I don't want that to happen. Again, I want this uh, to be uh, conceptually appealing to everyone. Um, one of the things, though, uh, that's uh, well known is that when you're dealing with straight lines uh, in a graph situation, uh, that there are certain characteristics of straight lines. Every straight line uh, that we have can really be represented by an equation. And the equation is shown here on this slide, y equals mx plus b. And this is something that we learned as part of our algebra lessons long ago. Uh, that, that, in fact, uh, lines uh, have some characteristics. One thing about a line when you're on a data plot is that at some point it's going to cross through the y-axis. Uh, it's impossible to have a line that doesn't cross the y-axis. And, and knowing where this line crosses the y-axis is very useful. Now, another thing you, you, we always know about lines is you know, they can be sloping sharply upwards or kind of flat or even sloping downwards. And so Another thing that we learned in algebra about lines is they have these two general traits. One is the y-intercept, and the other one is the slope of the line, uh, how steep or not steep that line is. And so uh, in algebra, we uh, were handed or given uh, a certain formula that really uh, suggests to us that y is a function of x. And that formula is y equals mx plus b. And so that formula is useful. It's not something you have to do things with yet. But later, when you run your regression analysis, uh, you're going to need to interpret the information you're getting back. And some of the information you get back from regression models uh, really relates to the y-intercept and the slope of the line. And, and it's very useful, as you'll see later. And so uh, conceptually, just appreciate that there's algebra behind what we're doing in regression. Um, now, let's just take a quick look at what we have here. Now, if we recognize that x is a random variable. Well, it really is. It's your independent variable. It's the value of the x line going across the bottom. Uh, and so we'll hold off on that discussion. Uh, recognize that m is your slope. It's often referred to as rise and run, uh, which means up and over. And, um, and then uh, recognize that the b value in y equals mx plus b tells us where uh, the uh, y-intercept exists, where, where the line crosses the y-axis. Remember what the y-axis is now, right? It's our dependent variable. And so it's very useful uh, to us later because we can ask ourselves, if I set x to 0, if my independent variable has a value of 0, uh, what is the value of y? And that becomes the y-intercept, right? That's our, our v variable. And so it has useful information for us later. So don't glaze over on this stuff. Um, just recognize that there's some important concepts behind what we are doing in regression analysis. And uh, as we go through this process, um, we're going to uh, be really understanding or studying what happens here. Now, I do have to take one second and step back from this. Uh, there are uh, a number of excellent videos about statistics on YouTube. And uh, one person in particular, Brandon Foltz, F-O-L-T-Z, has a really brilliant series of lectures, uh, really a great uh, series of, of lectures about lots of different statistics, including uh, simple linear regression, multiple regression. And um, Brandon's uh, lectures are there for you, and I encourage you to go read them or review them. Uh, the only uh, downside is that there's a lot of lectures and they're long, so it would take you hours and hours and hours uh, to review all of Brandon's lectures. And I'm trying to kind of compress his main concepts here it's structured a little differently. I have my own twist on it. And so a lot of the concepts that you're seeing here and some of the visuals as well are uh, extracted from Brandon Foltz's uh, presentation material. So I just want to make that caveat here and give a lot of credit to Brandon for doing a brilliant job with his work. Uh, and the uh, 
Examples that I use and a lot of the material that I use here uh, are um, parallel, in some cases, from his uh, presentations on YouTube. So please feel free, if you want more detail about any of these things, to dive into Brandon Fultz's lectures. And just um, do a query on YouTube, and you'll find his name and his lectures pretty easily. OK, so let's move along. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, we uh, um, need to understand or appreciate is that the y equal mx plus b uh, format is a, makes some assumptions about the data. The assumptions that it makes about the data is that the data points are precise data points taking, taken from facts. Uh, and so uh, there is you know, absolute, you know, absolute numbers incorporated in your data line. And when we're using statistics, one of the primary reasons we use statistics is because we uh, generally sample data from our target population, because the target population is so hard or difficult to access. And uh, without getting into the details uh, of sampling, uh, samples often have the potential to not exactly 100% represent the, total po the target population. And so there's a potential that there's error in our data points. And so because this reality exists, uh, we, uh, in regression, have to make some adjustments to the y equals mx plus b equation. And that's what this slide suggests to you. Uh, and so if you follow the y equal mx plus b up to the right-hand side, uh, you'll see the equation restructured as y equal beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus epsilon error. And, uh, and the error on the right-hand side is the uh, potential that the sample uh, is not exactly like the target population. So um, that's just important to recognize that you know, when we adopted the y equal mx plus b from algebra for statistics, uh, we had to adapt it to uh, the reality of statistics, which is we're generally using samples and not target population data. And so uh, if you follow now down to the bottom left, you'll see that we've, uh, uh, we've moved the epsilon to the left side. Uh, to simplify the equation, we have epsilon times y equals beta 0 plus b1x, uh, where, where um, epsilon y or ey is the expected value of y, or the, it's, the, it's the, the part of y that represents the middle of the error range. And I'll get into that later. Don't get too confused about this. Uh, the thing is, when you are dealing with regression analysis later, you won't see it stated as y equals mx plus b, and you'll see it stated slightly differently. And I'll show you on the next slide uh, what that looks like. Okay, um, this is uh, this slide here just shows you that uh, that e sub y that we were talking about in the previous slide. Um, can be the error of y, uh, that sampling error can be a small sampling error. In other words, the uh, sample looks a lot like the target population, or it can be substantial. And I could tell you in a later lecture, and I will, uh, what factors cause samples to have error. But we don't want to focus on that today. We just assume that they do have some level of error. And then on the right-hand side, you see that that's a case where the sample uh, has more error. In other words, it doesn't really the data points really uh, have some degree of variance from the target population. So uh, no need to, to stress on this. Just recognize that we're going to restructure the uh, y equal mx plus b to accommodate potential error in the sample. Um, another um, another uh, thing that you can appreciate or need to understand as background information is when we're talking about the slope of a line, that the slope can represent uh, a positive value, which is the example we've been showing, where the line is on an upward slope, um, it can also be zero. And we talked about that, or we will talk about that in the next segment. And if the slope is zero, it's really a straight line. It's a horizontal line. You see that on the left side of the presentation. Or you could have a slope that's a negative number. And if a slope is a negative number, um, the uh, rise and run moves down instead of up, and therefore your line slopes downward. So you can have negative relationships um, as well. So just an important thing to keep in mind that the slope can be positive, negative, or zero. Uh, OK, so finishing uh, with our uh, discussion here of the um, 
modification of y equal mx plus b, uh, when we last left it a couple of slides ago, uh, we were looking at the expected value of y equal beta 0 plus beta 1x. Um, and uh, the um, final format, uh, once we uh, decide to simplify again, is, uh, is shown at the bottom of this uh, slide. And you can see uh, we uh, characterize in regression analysis our regression uh, line as y hat equal beta 0 plus beta 1x. Now, uh, the beta 1x is our uh, slope, and the beta 0 is our y-intercept. Uh, it's a slightly reverse format from y equal mx plus b, um, but it's still exactly the same value. So instead of having the mx on the left side, we now have moved beta 1x to the right side. So um, just conceptually understanding, and we'll get into this later, uh, that our regression equation for our regression line is y hat equal beta 0 y-intercept plus beta 1x, which is our slope. Okay, and we'll come back to this later. Again, the whole objective of discussing this is so that you can understand that there's some mathematics behind uh, regression lines and regression models. Okay, we'll shift our attention slightly um, to a new concept. Uh, this is a concept I referred to briefly before, uh, which is uh, the concept that uh, a line, when we run a line through our data points, uh, it has the potential to have some error in the line. And the error is accounted for by the data points that are not exactly on the line. And we want to sort of study that a little bit and see what we can do with it. Uh, and so this is a very important concept to understand because, again, later, uh, mechanically, uh, you need to be uh, responsible for knowing about how much error exists in a regression model. And then uh, if someone challenges you or asks you, can you reduce the error, being able to say, no, it's, this is the best I can do, this is the best fit line, or being able to say, well, let me take a look at it and go back and understand other uh, reasons for why the error exists, and being able to reduce the error in the regression model. Now, that's extremely important. If you're using the regression model to predict future events, future situations, future values, uh, it's very important that that prediction be as accurate as possible. And so uh, you really want to have the best possible model of the situation. And so understanding uh, error and what causes error and how to reduce the error is really important. So uh, again, we're at the concept level now. Uh, we're not in mechanics yet. Uh, and we want to take a look at, uh, at uh, the concept of error and what to do with error and how to measure it. So that's what we're going to discuss in this section. So we're going to use an example. I've introduced this example already. Uh, we're going to imagine that we're the owner of a small restaurant. Uh, we're uh, also going to imagine that intuitively we know that there's a relationship between uh, when a customer pays the bill, how much tip they leave. We know that there's a relationship between those two variables. Um, and what we'd like to really do is to uh, make an estimate of waiter compensation uh, by predicting how much the amount of tips that the waiter might expect. I mean, if we have a pretty good sense of what our typical nightly bills are and how much customers are paying for food, then we can sort of predict, uh, if we have an effective model, what uh, the earnings might be for the waiter. So we want to uh, ask ourselves about the relationship between bill amount and tip amount. Tip amount is our primary focus because we want to find out the compensation for waiters. So the tip amount is going to be our dependent variable. Uh, and we're going to collect data about the bill amount, our independent variable, and our tip amount uh, for six meals. So uh, now let's, uh, in order to uh, make an important concept about error, uh, let's assume that we actually, uh, instead of collecting data on both the meals and the tips, we only collected the data on tips. And so we have a situation here where we collect the data for six different meals, but we only collected the tip amount. Uh, so here's the question. Uh, since we don't have two variables, we only have one variable, a dependent variable, can we really make a prediction about the future amount, uh, the future meals, about the tip amount for future meals using only this tip data? You know, you might initially look at this and say, well, no, not really, because you don't have the meal amount, so there's nothing to sort of balance, balance the tip amount against. Well, in reality, uh, back when we were studying uh, descriptive statistics, uh, we uh, understood how to take and calculate certain descriptive characteristics of this data, right? And one of those 
uh, was the uh, average or the mean of this data. And so, in fact, as you'll see in a second, uh, we do have some predictive ability here, even though we only have one variable. And so let's take a look at the predictive ability of data when we really only have one variable. So uh, in this diagram, uh, what we've done is we've calculated uh, the average tip amount based on the six, the six values that we collected earlier. And so if you uh, use your Excel or your pencil uh, to calculate the average of 5 and 17, 11, 8, 14, and 5, you'll see that the average is $10. And since this is our, our dependent variable, and dependent variables are always on the y-axis, then our y sub bar, or our average for y, is $10. And so uh, we're able on our uh, scatter plot to be able to plot a straight line uh, that represents the average. It just starts at 10 on the y-axis and goes straight across. And so uh, the y-intercept is uh, 0, uh, 10, and, um, and our slope, what is our slope on this line? It's 0, right? There is no slope. Um, so as we mentioned before, we can have straight lines with the slope of 0. Uh, and so uh, we understand that even though we only have one variable and no other information, uh, we can do a prediction, but the best prediction we can do is really the mean uh, value of the sample. And so uh, if you start to look at the data points on this diagram uh, and you look at how far they are from that flat line, you can see that there's uh, quite a distance between the data points uh, and this uh, straight line that we've drawn. Uh, notice that the third data point um, is fairly close to the line. Uh, it's 11, right? But uh, most other points are pretty far from the line. And so uh, if we ask ourselves, is this a good predictive tool, it would be useful to be able to say, well, let's take a look at how much error we really have in this model. And so uh, it's fairly easy to do the math here um, and see if this line is a perfectly predictive line or, or not a perfectly predictive line. It would be perfectly predictive if every data point lied exact, lie exactly, lie exactly on the line. But as you can see, um, the data points don't. And since they don't lie on the line, then we have some degree of error. And so the question is, can we measure the level of error? Well, we can. We can uh, look at how far each of these uh, data points um, lie from the line. Now, uh, terminology-wise, you need to understand what a residual is. A residual is the distance of a data point from its straight line. And uh, that's also, the term is also error. So residual is the same word as error. And so you'll see residual used most often because it sounds a little cooler than error. But uh, but we're really talking about how much residual uh, value exists here, how much error exists. And so we look at the first data point, it's a minus 5 from the line. We look at the second data point, it's plus 7 from the line. Third data point is plus 1. Fourth data point, minus 2. And so forth, right? So you get the idea. Now, uh, what you might notice, um, if you add up all of those values uh, together, you get plus 12 um, in error and minus 12 in error. And if you add those two together, guess what your answer is in terms of the total amount of error? Zero. Well, we know that's not right, right? because uh, there's clearly error in this model. And those data points are not on the line, and they really uh, don't um, they really don't represent a perfect line, and the error values add up to zero. So that's really a little misleading. And so uh, we understand that. Uh, we know that uh, this adds up to zero. And so uh, we have a technique that we use, and we use it in a lot of different cases. We use it uh, when we're studying um, standard deviation as well, uh, that in order to really understand the error, we need to take and, and not have it be equal to zero. And we do that by squaring the um, amounts that we calculated on the previous slide. So if you uh, look at the chart on this slide here, you can see that we've taken the errors, which all add up to zero, uh, in the column on the right called residual, and they add up to zero, not very useful. So we actually uh, use a technique called uh, squaring of the error, squaring of the residuals. And if we do that, uh, it, we have a couple of benefits. One is it takes out the negative signs, right? A negative times a negative is always positive. And two is it uh, puts some emphasis on those bigger numbers, uh, you know, that plus 7 and those minus 5s become some pretty significant numbers, which is useful to us. So when we uh, take the error uh, and we square the error, uh, we get rid of the negative signs. We get numbers that are squared. So we take minus 5 and square it, we get 25, plus 7, we get 49, and so on. 
And then when we add the, the sum of the, those squared residuals or squared errors together, we get a number 120. That's a useful number because it tells us that the sum of the errors of the squared errors, the SSE, is equal to 120. And so now we have a tool, and this is a very useful tool, and we can ask ourselves, and we'll get into this in detail mechanically, uh, we can ask ourselves, can we get a regression line that has less of an error than 120? Because we know 120 is probably the worst we can get because it, it's a one variable uh, a regression line, and it's just the average. It's not a very predictive line. So this 120 is useful to us. It's a it's a real, it's a poor number. It's a it's a big error. And so uh, one of the objectives that we're going to have as we go through this is to be able to understand different concepts in linear regression that enable us to have a smaller amount of error. And so that's really important. Uh, I'll come back to that in my summary in a second. Uh, you know, sum of squared errors is a useful number to us, and we'll talk about that. Okay, this uh, picture uh, illustration here is just another way to show that we actually did sum up the squares, right? And then you guys should see the, the actual physical uh, uh, squares of the errors, and you can see that that adds up to um, 120. And so uh, your task, should you choose to accept it, is to be able to measure error, and we have tools to do that for us, it makes it nice and easy, to know what's causing the error, and we'll get into that later, and then to take steps. Whatever state steps you as a statistician, an analyst, or an interested person in statistics can do to reduce the level of error in our regression model. And that's important. Okay, so that's that's where we are. Okay, the, another very important point is uh, when we uh, uh, have this 120 value, uh, we know that that value was developed using only the dependent um, variable. And so uh, we want to suggest to ourselves that by adding other variables into the equation, we can reduce the error. And then we might add an independent variable that reduces the error, error a little bit. And we might look at a different independent variable and try that one, and it might reduce it even more. And so we're sort of going to get into this very important concept that what we're going to try to do uh, is improve the goodness of the straight line in our data models. That's what we're going to be doing in linear regression, right? So, um, so uh, everything that we try to do from now on will be to try to take that SSE of 120 and be able to reduce it. And the tools and techniques and methods that we use for that will be very useful to you. Okay, so uh, this is the end of uh, my first lecture, the concepts lecture. Uh, I'd like to summarize the key points we've discussed. Um, first, understand that regression is a study of the relationships among variables. The prime variable, the prime issue of being studied is usually structured as a dependent variable, and it's always on the y-axis. Um, and then we can introduce one or more uh, causal variables uh, that have some relationship with the dependent variable, and we call those the independent variables. In simple linear regression, we're going to introduce just one IV, independent variable, and then multiple regression, we're going to introduce multiple independent variables at the same time. Uh, we uh, use and examine the relationship between our variables using scatter plot diagrams. For visual people, you ought to be going, all right, this is great. Uh, we uh, have reviewed and discussed the fact that uh, as you uh, introduce a straight line into uh, your data, your scatter plot, uh, that we have some uh, principles of algebra that, that come to bear. Uh, y equal mx plus b tells us about that line. It tells us uh, where the uh, line intersects on the y-axis. And it tells us about the slope or the steepness of the line. Uh, and that's the mx part of the equation. Uh, but we also recognize that because we're dealing with sample data and we have natural error uh, in sampling, that we have to restructure the equation a bit. And so we simply have flipped it around. We'll call it y hat. And we will have the beta 0 being the y-intercept. And we'll have the b1 uh, times x uh, be the slope. Okay, So uh, when you talk about the regression equation, it'll be y hat equal beta 0 plus beta 1x. And then we went through the sum of squares concept. We recognize that when we draw a straight line, not every point's going to be on that line. And, and the distance of those points from the line uh, is really how much error we have in our model. And so um, when we introduced just the one variable, just the dependent variable, 
the best thing we could do in terms of uh, predicting um, future values is use the mean, right, with slope of zero, and that represents the, the mean. Um, and so in, in that case, what we did was we uh, measured the distance of each data point from the line, and that gave us the error. The problem with that was that the errors all added up to zero, so they weren't very useful. And so in order to have something that is useful, we took the errors that we measured, we squared them, which took away the negative values, and also emphasized the bigger uh, errors. And we added those up, and it gave us a value called the, the, the sum of square of residuals, error, the sum of square of error, and the SSE. And so that's going to be very useful to us later because we're going to come back and we're going to remember that uh, we need to always ask ourselves, you know, what is the level of error in this model? What is the SSE? Uh, and that's given to us by our statistical packages. And why did we get uh, the level of SSE that we got? And what can we do to reduce it and to a point where we are confident that our model is the best possible regression analysis model? End of lecture one, I'll pick up with simple linear regression in lecture two.